Recording? I'm going to start this recording too. Okay, hopefully I don't have to do any adjusting there. And when he comes in, you're just going to hit start. Is it live right now? Yeah. yeah. Hey, welcome if you're just tuning in. We're just waiting for Ryan now. It's 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 up. It is up. Okay. I got it going on my phone. It's working. Whew. You want to just text me the link or something? Yeah. Start virtual camera. Record on the record on the Zoom. Oh, hello there. Hey. Hey. Hey, Ryan. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. What is your name? I assume it's not Mary Jean Cormier. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Derek Munoz. I'm from Santa Lake First Nation, and I'm a student here at Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School. In Thunder Bay. Oh, hello. It's, it's, it's Derek, right? I heard that correct? Yeah. Correctly? Okay, great. Nice to meet you, Derek. Pleasure. Thank you. I'm a student here at Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School, and I'm also our student council chief. Wow, nice. Congratulations. My God, that's a lot of responsibility. Thank you. And today is a very special day for us because recently our media club was learning about finding ideas for stories, doing interviews, researching, and booking guests. That work led to an interview this morning with famous actor and humanitarian Ryan Reynolds. Nice to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi guys. Oh, I didn't get now I see everyone there. Wow. Hi everyone. Nice nice to see you all. Nice to meet you. Good morning, Mr. Reynolds. It is so nice to meet you. Good morning. Thank you for joining me in my media class today. And if I may ask, where are you joining us from today? I'm, I'm in New York City, which is the great state of New York. Wow. Uh, in the old country, the United States of America. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, in, I'm not in, at, uh, in my original home of Vancouver today, but I'm, I'm you know, thank, thank God for Zoom. I get to join you from wherever I am. Mm -hmm. I hear it's beautiful in New York City this time of year it's pretty uh you know derek that's a, just a bald faith lie <laughs> in new york city uh, this time of year but uh but i'll take it i don't know i'm you know i'm used to a little bit of cold weather mm -hmm. you know we all are right well i can't imagine how it is in vancouver hopefully it's better i think so yeah no i'm, I'm not complaining i'm just saying let's let's not get crazy with the beautiful talk <laughs> um, it's, uh, but it's great. I'm, I'm really excited to do this uh, this interview with, with with you. You know, I did a bit of this stuff in, when I was in in high school, and I would have loved to have, you know, interviewed uh, uh, somebody who is in a line of work that I happen to be in now, or I'm lucky enough to be in. So I'm uh, I'm really excited to be here. That sounds good. We appreciate you so much for taking the time to ch chat with us. Today. 
Sure. Okay, so if you don't mind, let's begin. Sure. So from right from the top, when did you begin acting? When did I begin acting? Um, gosh, I was uh, I was pretty young. I was about thirteen years old when I when I got my first acting job. But I I was very lucky. I didn't. Um, I, I was the, the, I did a, a little show that was shot in in Ottawa, um, uh, Ontario, and um, I loved it. Um, I had a lot of fun. I wasn't um, I wasn't I had no experience at all. But I what what I did have experience in was improv comedy. I started in that, um, so that gave me enough of a, that invaluable foothold in to sort of feel a little bit like I knew what I was doing. Um, but I wasn't you know I, I didn't experience anything like fame from that or any of that other stuff. So I had a really normal childhood aside from these little moments of working on on shows and that sort of stuff because most of the things i did sh were aired or at least were shown in the united states but weren't shown uh in vancouver or canada um where i was from so i just went back to school like any normal kid and had a paper route um i uh i ended up kind of s jumping out of show business and working in a at a grocery store uh midnight to 8 a.m for a couple of years at a grocery store called safeway um, in Vancouver, and then um, and then when I turned uh, eighteen, I got back into improv comedy, and that's why I, that's why I moved to Los Angeles to uh, to see if I could join a, a group called the Groundlings, which is a really famous improv comedy group um, in 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 Los Angeles. So that was my main goal for going down there. What it wasn't to work in 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 films; it was to be on stage. I'm so glad to hear that, Ryan. I'm so glad that your journey worked out and. That Thank you love you. what you're doing, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure yeah, you made all, all of us Canadians proud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, but you do more than acting. Why have you got to do other things like your your gin company and owning sports teams? Um, you know, that's a that's a, a slightly more nuanced uh, question. You know, I, I actually would be so bold as to say that there is a kind of a a connected tissue or a through line between all of these things and that's I love storytelling um, you know um, I love marketing which is why I, I, I own a, a gin company why I own a, a, a telecom company these days and, and, a, and a Welsh football club or soccer as we say in North America but uh, we call it football over there um, it's all storytelling I love stories I love these stories can be found anywhere you know you're a journalist Derek you understand I mean, you understand that better than almost anyone it's um it's always about the story you don't know where it's going or what it's going to be but uh if you're listening and you have a pretty open mind and an open heart as you're doing it you can kind of you can uncover some pretty spectacular uh spectacular moments so I, I genuinely love what I do I love storytelling and that's that's why I get involved if you if you follow any sports this is why I love sports um I wouldn't say I'm a sports nut, but I love the context of sports, right? Like if if you follow if you follow sports and you, you 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 learn a little bit about certain players on a team that you maybe admire, and you learn about where that player has come from or what that player has overcome to be in this uh, incredibly privileged and fortunate position that that player is in, um, that makes it much more um, riveting. It makes it much more entertaining. It makes it much more interesting. Um, so I love that part of uh, sports, and I think that's why I've gotten involved with. Um, sports ownership is because I love I love telling not just the story of the team but I like telling the story of the community around that team and, and more often than not the two are inextricably linked. That is a really great answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 underst I understand that. I, I understand that storytelling is everywhere in our everyday lives. And I, I really yeah. understand that. Too. Yeah, for sure. That's I why I think you're in it. You're, 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 you're in what's called an evergreen business, Derek. You're always going to be able to tell stories, and they're always going to be all around you. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And another sports-related question here. How are you feeling about potentially becoming a, an owner of the Ottawa Senators? If I wasn't in my own apartment, I would have spat that out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, you know, uh, we'll, you know, we'll see. There's not too much I can say about that right now, but I'm, 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 I have a, a real connection to um, Ottawa, to the community of Ottawa. I feel like I have a, um, I don't feel like I have the, uh, a, the a unilateral perspective on the community in, in, in Ottawa, but I certainly have a perspective on how to tell the story of Ottawa, um, and you know, through the prism of what it means to me. Um, I spent quite a bit of time there when I was younger, and. Um, and I think that the, the Ottawa Senators as an organization um, can explode, I feel, not just um, 
from in its within its own community within Canada, but also I think globally, um, and that's something I'm I'm deeply interested in. But we'll see we'll see where it, where it shakes out. Um, the journey's also been really interesting. I've learned so much. I've learned more about the inner workings of the NHL over the last couple of months than I, I would have ever dreamed. Of. So it's been it's been a lot of fun. Oh, that is so great to hear. And if I may ask, have you always been a fan of the Ottawa Senators? Um, I've always watched them, but I, I, I tend to watch almost all sports, um, unless it's maybe the Wrexham uh, Red Dragons, Wrexham AFC, but my, my football club in, in Wales. I tend to watch most sports, um, sort of eager to see both sides. <laughs> you know, I, I find when I'm watching sports, I'm not necessarily... My kids do that all the time. They say... You know, they say, who are you voting for, Dad? I don't know why they use the word voting. Um, like, I have a vote in the matter. Um, <laughs> but they, they tend to look at it, you know, in that sort of um, binary way, a winner and a loser. And I try to tell them that, you know, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. I, 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 I'm interested in both teams. But uh, certainly if, um, if we progress with the Ottawa Senators, I will be a frothy, rabies-infused fan, uh, the likes of which the NHL has never seen. That is great to hear, but thank thank you for sharing that. Okay, but now let's turn into something more serious. We know you have support. Please. We know you have to support efforts to bring clean water, clean drinking water to First Nation communities. But what else do you think that that we can do to that could be done to take to get the government to take real action? Um, well, I can I can um, I can speak from. Uh, only my own perspective, which is that I didn't I didn't feel like somebody in a position like mine uh, could criticize the federal government without having my own skin in the game, so to speak, um, which is why my wife and I um, contributed, a, a, I think, a pretty significant, um, um, made a cons pretty significant contribution to uh, Water First uh, NGO, which I think is an incredible um, organization. Specifically, they're, I think they're incredible because they, they empower um, indigenous communities to, um, you know, operate these within their own leadership, um, uh, spectrums. And I think that that's, that's super important. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I look, I look at it like if, if, um, you know, a neighborhood in the greater Toronto region or Vancouver or, you know, pick any major city in, in, in within the country of Canada, uh, didn't have, had, had the, the water that was, undrinkable uh, the way it is in a lot of First Nations and Indigenous communities, um, I, I, that problem I feel like would be solved pretty quickly. Um, so I think that there's a, a, a level of inequity and injustice there that that is not, um, that, that, hasn't, um, that, that hasn't been a, a priority. I mean, priority one for not just the federal government, but you know, any civilized community, particularly a community as wealthy um, as Canada. Um, so, you know, that's, that's why, I, you know, lent my voice to it and, and contributed um, my own um, my own money to it and, and as much as you know we, we can to sort of help um, grow that movement and I think the more people the more people are aware of it I think the the, uh, the more likely people are to take action and that's I see that happening now it's, uh, it's starting to snowball and hopefully this is something that you know we is in our rearview mirror as soon as possible mm, I agree with you I, I, we really appreciate your concerns, lending your voice and your platform to bringing this awareness to everyone. I re of regardless yeah. of where we're from, I believe everyone deserves clean drinking water, and uh, I believe yeah. that we should get along. Yeah, I also I also believe in you know um, you know equity, and I think that there's there's you know communities like particularly indigenous communities that that aren't that don't have something as as basic uh, a human right as as clean drinking water is. Um, it's kind of you know it's it's inconceivable to me. So um, yeah, the, 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 we we've we've got to figure that one out fast, and it's completely and utterly fucking inexcusable. Excuse my language. Mm -hmm. yeah. No worries. Well, thank you, thank you. I, I really appreciate that, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people appreciate. It. Okay, next question. Uh, what inspires you to raise awareness of issues and and help with so many causes all around the world? Um, I think I can, I can, in this only, in this instance, I could maybe speak for my wife. I wouldn't pretend to do it any other situation, but, um, uh, you know, we both, uh, 
<laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, we, we, both, uh, we both feel, you know, pretty uh, strongly about, you know, the position that we're in of, of privilege, and I believe in, in spending that privilege, and I mean quite literally spending it, is, is important. Um, I think sharing power, sharing wealth, stepping aside uh, where needed is is important and it doesn't it doesn't drastically change my life to do these things it makes my life richer um so you know for us it's 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 a way of you know enjoying what we have if we're sharing it you enjoy your what you have a lot more if you're if you're if you're sharing it so the, our kind of general goal of some of the programs we've created like the group effort initiative um which uh you know, creates a platform for communities who have been systemically excluded, systemically discriminated against, um, or overlooked or marginalized um, communities to uh, gain a foothold into the film industry. Uh, Creative Ladder is an organization that we started that does the same for marketing communities. I own a marketing company and, um, you know, it's also selfish what I do because it's, I think that we all, with broader perspectives and, and, and more perspectives and with more people working in industries with diverse um, experiences, we tell better stories. Um, you know, you got a bunch of white guys in a room telling a story. It's not going to be nearly as dynamic as if, as if that room is has you know a rich cultural diversity. Um, so you know, it's it's selfish in that context. That I love telling stories. I want to be a better storyteller. I want the people that work at my companies who are also telling their own stories and creating their own stories to be operating and, and, and pulling from an incredibly um, diverse and interesting uh, pool of experiences. Um, those are important stories. So, you know, for us, it's, it's a little bit about that, I think, um, you know, and then ultimately kind of if I were to sort of distill it into one sentence, you know, the hope is that you can create um, a position for a lot of folks where they have generational wealth, which is just something that has, um, systemically looted them for for many generations, uh, and sort of changing or at least creating a wedge in that in that system that has um, overlooked them for so long. So creating generational wealth is very important. And by generational wealth, I just mean like people people um, having the opportunity and the access to build their own you know um, um, network of a financial network, owning a home you know, the, retiring one day uh, and enjoying your life and then and then bequeathing that home or leaving that home to your family, to your kids and, and allowing them to then build off of that generational uh, wealth is is super important and it's afforded to a lot of um, aspects of our society and excludes, it excludes a lot of aspects of, uh, lot of fo- folks in, in within our society as well. So um, spreading that around and creating some equity uh, there is is pretty important to, to me and to, to my wife, like as well. I fully agree. I, I feel like sometimes every, everyone forgets to count their blessings. Uh, me too, sometimes. And I strongly support your view of equity. And I believe that no matter where we come from, we have to be treated. And, and I believe that everyone deserves some justice. And yeah, I, and I, 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 you know, I, these interviews sometimes paint, you know, the, in, the interview subject in a, in a rosy way. I forget these things too, you know. I, I forget myself and my place and my, you know, I have my moments and my days as well. But uh, so, you know, I'm certainly not in, infallible or certainly um, um, beyond reproach in that way. But uh, but I do believe it's incumbent upon people in my position to share um, and, and help grow uh, opportunities for other people to experience the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And I want to bring up, uh, there are some students here from DFC who are from Bearskin Lake First Nation. And we know that you offered support during a COVID-19 outbreak there. And we want to know what, what inspired you to help. Uh, I, I heard, heard the story, you know, I mean, anytime you, uh, I have a pretty large uh, platform. So if, if I can um, shine some light on a, a, a story like the folks were experiencing uh, during the pandemic, uh, in that particular community, uh, I do it, you know, I, it's, um, I'm not always on, I certainly have to turn social media off sometimes just to, just to keep my own marbles. But, uh, um, you know, those are situations where if, if I can take some action, uh, of course I do. And, you know, uh, the story I found was, I found to be, you know, completely, um, um, riveting and horrifying, um, all at once. And, um, so yeah, that was I was just I read about the story and I was I was inspired by the folks that were uh, struggling there. Mm-hmm. I think I understand. 
we appreciate your efforts and your and your platform that you use to raise awareness. Thank and, you, Dad. And I want to ask, have you ever been to a First Nation community? Um, I have, yeah, a, a bunch as a kid. There's, um, you know, growing up in British Columbia, there's, um, there's, there's indigenous communities all over, um, and you know, um, getting to experience some of those firsthand and. Um, through the Group Effort Initiative, our, uh, one of our um, film nonprofits, I've, I've had the, the great opportunity to work side by side with um, many people from First Nations communities, and it's been a uh, on, it's been such a wonderful uh, and remarkable uh, journey and learning experience for me. Oh, that's good. While you were in those communities, have you ever tried any First Nations traditional food? I don't remember if I have. Oh no. I might have. I'm not sure. I, I can't. I, off the top of my head, I can't. I can't remember. I don't know. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm always down for pretty much, you know, trying anything from a culinary perspective. Uh, so I would imagine I have. I just can't remember. At this point. <laughs> yeah. I understand. Yeah. Well, hopefully you had some good stuff. Uh, I'd recommend a couple good ones like bannock and fry bread. Yeah. If you ever get the chance, I'd totally recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> done and done. Mm -hmm. Done and done. Yeah. So you travel. I, I noticed that you travel around the world to shoot movies, and I hear like that you like to take pictures. Do you have a favorite place that you like to photograph? Um. Oh boy, favorite place that I like to take photographs. I don't. You know, one of the I think some of my favorite. Um. Well, my favorite photos are of of, of uh, my kids. <laughs> um. That's until one day they turn against me and you know take my life on <laughs> fire. Um, I, uh, I, but I've always loved um, um, taking. I mean, I spent a, a huge chunk of time in Africa in my twenties and thirties, and I, I love taking photos there. The sky is somehow. I don't. The only way I could really describe it is the sky feels bigger. Somehow, I'm not really sure why that is, but um, some of my favorite photographs are are from Malawi. Um, in Africa and, and, uh, and certainly in South Africa as well. Mm -hmm. I can I can imagine the landscape there. It must be so beautiful. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, it's one of the most spectacular people in particular. Just uh, beautiful, beautiful people. Sometimes I bet that must be lovely. Just taking a break from all the filming, all the business, just to take a moment to look at the sky. Yeah, it's pretty nice. These days, I don't. You know, usually there's a a six, uh, a, a, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, or a three-year-old jumping on my jugular or my neck uh, <laughs> first thing in the morning. So I don't always have <laughs> the time to uh, to to sort of unplug uh, that way. But I don't know. Maybe maybe one day when I get sensible and just leave my family. <laughs> <laughs> well. If it ever comes to that, I hope I hope it works out the best for you. <laughs> I'll see you guys first. Um, yeah, and for those, if, if this ends up in print somewhere, let's just say right now, unequivocally, I was kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you read it, you're like, what a jerk. <laughs> when you see it, you're like, oh, he's still a jerk, but not that bad. So, yeah. Well, if it go ends up in print, and I'll I'll make sure that they get that. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Thank you for having my back. No worries, no worries. <laughs> and here's here's a rather silly question that we would all love to know. What do you think about Shania Twain changing the lyrics of her song using your name instead of Brad Pitt? Well, I, I think I, we can all agree it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was kind of I mean the moment it was it was I was not expecting that. Uh, I'll say that. Much. Um, <laughs> I was mostly thinking because, like a lot of people, I get very nervous when I have to do um, when I have to publicly speak. You know, when I have to stand on a platform, and then it's also just odd because it's like a, you're winning an award, so it's like the I don't know. I struggle. Maybe it's because I grew up in Canada and I sort of tend to um, rely on laughing at myself as a defense mechanism. But in those moments, you have to be pretty gracious. And when you're accepting an award, like a, a whatever that the icon award, you know, I, I didn't know it. I just, I just felt the whole thing was a little embarrassing. So when Shania called it out, I was so grateful because it sort of left the it took the tension out of my um, my body in a, in a good way. It made me think of something else for a second. So then I went up and gave my little speech and it went it went better than I would have thought. So I sort of in a weird way I have to thank Shania Twain for for that. <laughs> That's so good. And I agree with you that it was about time. 
Because <laughs> we have... Yeah. <laughs> well, well, if you choose bound to change it, we're the world's sexiest man, Ryan Reynolds. Right? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like you're going to marry Styles or someone, but I, I'll take it. Yeah. And next question. Uh, well, I want to know. Why did you agree to do this interview with us? Derek, I have no damn idea. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I've been regretting it since I logged on. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I, you know, I mean, for, for me, it's, uh, what is it, 30 minutes of chatting, um, you know, with a, a, a young upstart journalist that, you know, I hope will one day be kind to me when you're in the big leagues. Um, you know, so it all comes back to pure selfishness. Um, no, I, 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 I think it's, I think it's great. Cause like, look, you, you, you land an interview with me. Now you'll go after someone else and you'll be able to say, oh, well, Ryan did it. You know, that's how it works. It's all horse trading. It's all of that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that's always how it, it I, anytime I can give somebody that sort of, and I don't know, maybe you've already interviewed, uh, Shania Twain and Brad Pitt, as far as I know, <laughs> but, um, I would say, I would say that it, it generally the economy, of uh, storytelling and journalism, unfortunately, works this way, right? Like, you, you know, they, they, if you ask for an interview with somebody, oftentimes they'll say, well, who have you interviewed before? It's like trying to get a credit card for the first time. They'll say, well, what's your credit score? And you're like, well, I, <laughs> I don't have a credit card. How am I supposed to have a credit if I don't have a credit card? Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit about, you know, wanting to share some of my privilege and my good luck and good fortune with you today and, and let you have some of it and you know, you can take it and grow it yourself, uh, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I completely understand. And I appreciate you planting the planting the seeds for the future for when I make the big leagues. And I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Derek, you're, you be, be your own vision board, buddy. You're already in the big leagues. You did it. Here we are. Thank you. Now go for it. I really Got appreciate it. that. Yeah. And here's kind of a personal question. I'm a big fan of your work, especially in the Deadpool series. So I would love to ask you a couple of questions about that. Please, fire I, away. I hope this one, this, this question doesn't sour on you, but I wanted to know, who would win in a fight between Green Lantern and Deadpool? <laughs> well, that's a good question, Derek. Um, well, in my heart, Green Lantern's already dead. So... <laughs> <laughs> How's that for a non-diplomatic answer? <laughs> But I agree. I think I think I think, I think Deadpool wins. Deadpool wins. But then yeah. I feel like Ryan Reynolds killed Green Lantern, not Deadpool. <laughs> what a big assistant! <laughs> yeah. And I want to know how has your Deadpool character helped you in real life? How has my Deadpool character? Well, I, I would say that in a weird way, I would almost reverse engineer that. I think I helped the Deadpool character because the Deadpool character is a persona. Um, it's a persona that I very much feels like it was superimposed onto my real life. I mean, I've always used um, humor uh, as deflection and as a self de self defense mechanism. Um, I think that that's exactly what Deadpool does as well. I think um, he sort of filters his pain um, through the prism of humor, and I think that that's what kind of makes him unique and interesting. Um, you know, and I think that that the way we tell stories with Deadpool is the way I like to tell stories in in both in real life, but also through my other ventures and my other companies and my marketing company. Is that necessity is the mother of invention. So, you know, I always find that you know, and especially working in Hollywood, you, things can tend to be they think bigger is better, and I sort of look at it like that. What murders creativity is too much time and too much money. So I love that Deadpool's always done on a very skinny budget and we're always trying to make, you know, create, you know, um, character moments instead of spectacle moments. I mean, but by spectacle, I mean like moments that cost a lot of money. They're huge CGI things. Usually the things that people remember from Deadpool films are something he said. And that to me is the best, uh, proof of, of, of concept with, with Deadpool is that that, you know, people are often quoting Deadpool as opposed to saying, do you remember that cool thing he did when he fought that whatever, you know, they're usually, a line, which I think to me is exactly what you want out of a franchise like that. I'm so glad to hear that. And I think you captured the Deadpool character, the essence of the Deadpool character perfectly. If I, if I, 
I heard any other activist can get involved, like, no, that's Noah. It, that's Ryan. Well, <laughs> one day, one day it will happen. Just get ready. I promise you that. It'll, one day it will, I will no and longer do it and someone else will take over. Mm -hmm. And next question about this. Uh, it's kind of related to the future. Will you play Deadpool as long as or as, or longer than Hugh Jackman has been playing Wolverine? <laughs> <laughs> um, I promise you I will never play it as long as uh, Hugh Jackman uh, played Wolverine. Um, Hugh Jackman's been playing Wolverine since I was eased out of the womb. So, uh, <laughs> I, can't, uh, I can't imagine um, doing that. No, I, I look forward to handing it over. I look forward to seeing someone else interpret that you know um uh, you know and i think it'll be something completely different it won't be somebody doing it the way i did it'll be doing somebody doing it the way they want to do it and that's that's i think what's so beautiful about it so i kind of um i know it might not be the popular answer to say but I, i'm excited to see someone else um take it on mm -hmm. Understand. someday understand that yeah everyone has their own styles all, all different ways of storytelling and i think that's very important yeah. But yeah. I think you perfectly nailed your way of storytelling Deadpool. And I think a lot of people would agree with me. And I absolutely love your films. And I'm excited for that next movie coming up. Well, thank you, Derek. I'm literally, I, my screen right now is the Zoom box with you. And behind it is the script where I'm doing my 58th rewrite on it as we speak. So, <laughs> uh, yes, I, I'm quite literally working on it as, as, we, as we hang out. Cool. Uh, so, uh, my next question is, our school has a really special music festival here called Wake the Giant. It helps mm -hmm. to welcome students from remote First Nations into Thunder Bay. It brings the city together and raise awareness and encourages everyone to come together. And we, ha and we usually have a great uh, lineup of world famous acts and we want to know, would you ever consider coming to our festival or visiting our school? Do I have to know how to play a musical instrument or something, or? <laughs> no, no, you don't. That have might to. be a deal breaker. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I would love that. I would love an invite like that. You guys know where to find me now. You found me here, so um, I, and if, assuming I'm not, uh, you know, across the pond in the United Kingdom shooting the next Deadpool movie, I, I would love to, to be a part of something like that. Oh, Woo! that is so great to hear. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, for okay. sure. well, we will definitely keep you in mind whether it's five years from now or or the next festival we would definitely love to keep you in mind and have you there regardless that makes that makes it a lot more likely i, I if i if we we can pick a, a a year at a time and all that stuff i would love that i mean i love i love going north <laughs> i love going home um you know and i consider that whole that whole chunk of land the place that i grew up and 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 inhabited as a little kid so i i uh i love it oh well, that's great to hear and i think a bunch of people want to know would you ever be open to visiting a first nations community again in the future oh of course i mean that's a that's essential how could i not you know i mean you can't you know you, you can't work with these communities on the way i've been working with them and not also you know have the or or let's at least give yourself permission and the luxury to go and experience what those communities are all about firsthand. So, yeah, it's uh, it's something that's that's super important to me and um, super important super important to my family, not just my wife but also my brothers as well, um, who all live in British Columbia. And um, you know, that's something that um, I would love. I hope to one day uh, be living full time back again in in British Columbia. So, um, that's something that would be uh, would be beautiful. For sure. Oh, that's great to hear. Well, one day when I'm chief of Sandy Lake, uh, you're w more than welcome to come. Yeah, yeah. Sandy Lake. Yeah. Open invite. Yeah. Always open. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. That was all of our questions, and I really appreciate that you took the time to, to, to get interviewed by some kids from up northern Ontario. Of course, and I really appreciate your questions, Derek. They were thoughtful. They were smart. They had a we were diverse. It was excellent. I, uh, I, I'm in no position to give you a grade, but that was A plus if you ask me. So thank, thank you, you so uh, much. Thank and you for, for doing such a great job. I really appreciate it. And I have a question that a bunch of us would love to know. Might not sure. be the most appropriate, but why are you so sexy? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, 
God. I, I, there's, there's no way to answer that and not sound like a complete ninny. So, uh, uh, I don't I promise you there are, you could fill a thousand gymnasiums with my unsexy moments, that's for sure. <laughs> and you could probably fill a tiny uh, airplane bathroom with the, with the sexy ones. So, um, I, I, can, I can leave it at that, if that's all right. Well, thank you so much for your time, and we really appreciate it. And we'll definitely I keep in contact it. for you about Wake the Giant and maybe about 20 years time I'll keep in contact with you about the uh, Sandy Lake invitation. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. Okay. And that's a question that we weren't able to ask. I, I, I want to ask it. Would you ever be open to working with indigenous youth in the film industry? Well, I do. I mean, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the group effort initiative is is designed to to do just that to create um, a lot more diversity behind the camera, um, which is a lot. Of, which is really where the storytelling is is coming from. It's certainly in front of the camera is important, but you know, the folks that are actually pulling the strings, the 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 the, the folks that are actually making the story happen is a far more sustainable career than in front of the camera. I mean, I'm an anomaly. The fact that I've been able to do this for three decades uh, fooling people that are in letting me stay in front of the camera is crazy, but that's typically a much shorter uh, lifespan in terms of careers. Uh, but behind the camera, that's that's where, that's the soil for all the storytelling and, and that's where it happens. And that's where, you know, trades collide with, uh, with you know, creativity in, in some of the most beautiful um, ways. So I, of course, I wanna work with as many uh, indigenous youth and, and uh, communities is humanly possible, both in front of the camera and behind. I mean, that's something that um, we've we've been. My company, Maximum Effort, has been putting um, a huge investment towards for the last three years. Thank you so much for elaborating on that. And I think yeah. a lot of people from different indigenous communities will appreciate that all around the world. Yeah, and for sure. Well, that was all our questions, and and thank you. Uh, my school would love to say goodbye and wish you the best. Please, okay, great. Bye, guys. <laughs> oh, oh, he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>